Yes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining us here on INC Live for the UFC 268 preview show. My name is Carl Birmage, and joining me on the right-hand side of my screen, he is the Brian Campbell to my Luke Thomas. He is the conspiracy to my theory. He's John Marsh in MMA. John, thank you once again for joining me two times in two weeks. What's up, Carl? What's up, INC Live listeners? Yep. Back-to-back -back pay per views. That means I'm on the preview show back-to-back -back weeks, and we had an incredible card yesterday, and we're gonna have another incredible card coming up this weekend. I'm sure we're gonna recap the card from yesterday in a little bit here, but I'm already looking forward to these fights next week. The card is stacked. Another good seven or eight really quality top fights with well-known fighters. So this is a treat in uh, UFC terms. Certainly so, John. And I have to say, one of the things that's made me appreciate, though, is you have all these professional broadcasters who do this thing two or three times in a week talking about mixed martial arts. It makes me appreciate how good they have to be at their job because we've got two shows in two weeks and I'm absolutely exhausted. We've just got so <laughs> much to cover over what happened last night and what could potentially happen in seven days' time. Yeah, well, you you do a lot of quality work behind your videos, you know, organizing the graphics and editing the videos, you know, chopping the videos down and re-uploading them. So you do a lot of a lot of good work that like you know gets the content out there for the viewers. Me, I just kind of press record and um, send out a podcast every week. So I understand why it's a lot of work, but I'm sure the viewers are appreciating it. And you know, we're actually getting some really really quality fights. So the work is well well deserved, you know. And as mentioned before, we have got ourselves a jam-packed show once again. A lot of people debating whether 267 or 268 was the better of the two cards. If you had to choose between the two and sort of discount actually how the fights played out last night, which of the two cards would you say was the better on paper? I'm going with the 268 card just because I see way more competitive matchups. Like if you look at, um, you know, the numbers, number seven through number two ranked fight on this card from the green eye quinta fight all the way up to the zhang Wei Li fight those fights are all really evenly lined they're all like under a two to one favorite while last week yesterday's card uh, all six main card fights were above a two to one favorite so we're just getting a lot more competitive matchups i know the title fights are rematches i know we're going to talk about um whether Zhang and whether uh, Colby deserve these second title shots, but uh, that's a you know a problem for a little bit down the line. But I I'm looking forward to this Madison Square Garden card a little bit more. I feel like these um, MSG cards have a special feel to them. I'm pretty sure every card outside of UFC 230 maybe has like really really lived up to the expectations at MSG. So I'm picking this one uh, by a slight margin. What about you, Carl? I would lean towards this one as well. And I think you touched on something which I was going to bring up when we sort of got into 268 in a bit more detail. MSG is back for the first time since 2019. And I don't know if it's maybe the UFC hype which plays a part. I don't know if it's something about that arena itself. The MSG shows are nearly always special cards. Yeah, and even the one I just mentioned, you know, thinking back on a 230, I think that was Adesanya and Brunson. Cormier defeated um, Derek Lewis. I mean, it wasn't a bad card by any means. It just didn't, didn't have that same special feel like uh, 217 and um, 244 did. I think those are the only three. If Am I correct, Carl, with that? Uh, there's been one four, 205, 217, oh, 230, five. and 244 with BMF belt. I'm, yeah, telling I'm, you, the first one. I'm telling you, 230 would have been just as good if they did Shevchenko versus Eubanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? They robbed Sajara. Uh, honestly, this might sound stupid, but like Sajara does have the type of style that could give Shevchenko problems. But that's that's a problem for 10 podcasts down the line. I'm sure we'll be, we'll be uh, shitting on Shevchenko fights till the end of time. Before we get there, though, one thing we're not going to be shitting on, though, is UFC 267. We did promise a lot of people, inevitably, we would have to discuss that card in just a little bit more detail. And there is really only one place to start. Our UFC light heavyweight champion is 42-year-old Glover Teixeira. Just insane, man. I mean, I'm happy to live in you know a world where, where this is reality. Um, 
But you know, I didn't see it coming. I mean, if you go back and listen to our podcast, honestly, I'll admit it, probably about 80, 90 percent of what I said was wrong about that fight. But, you know, there's 500 fights a year. You get some right, some wrong. Uh, I happen to be wrong about this one. And, you know, I'm happy to be proven wrong by Glover Teixeira. Uh, just an incredible upset win. He actually had probably the least amount of, uh, of difficulty of any of his recent wins. I mean, he got rocked and had competitive fights with, uh, I think, almost all four or five of his wins in a row. This fight was relatively easy. One round one dominantly had a little bit of trouble in round two, but got right back to that takedown. And his top pressure was just too much for Blahovich. I thought Blahovich looked particularly uncomfortable, um, looked really bad in the grappling scenarios, um, just was a fish out of water on his back against Glover. And I just, I really underestimated the takedowns of Glover. And I really underestimated how bad Jan would look once he got taken down. So congrats to Glover. It was a crazy upset. And, you know, I, I was thrilled to see it. What about you, Carl? What was your initial reaction? I was in exactly the same boat. I mean, I have no issue with Jan Blahovitz whatsoever. Comes across like a really nice bloke. I think the way he handled himself in the post-fight speech was very good to see. You don't see that from a lot of champions. But... From my own personal perspective, just for what a good, feel-good moment it was, Glover Teixeira winning that belt at 42 years old. It was, it's like what we, what we always say, though. One of those great stories that you need in all sports is that idea of never giving up, persevering, and eventually good things happening to good people. And I think, uh, yeah, and I think Glover Teixeira is a fine example of that. Um, yeah. I did and your, s- your video came out just at the right time, right? Longest, longest title shots, uh, longest gap between title shots. And, you know, the, uh, the old guy pulls it off seven years apart. Didn't do great numbers video, though, which I was a little bit disappointed by. I saw it. That's all that matters, you know? <laughs> That's true. That is true. <laughs> uh, it wasn't the only title fight which took place during that night, though. What a fantastic fight. Piotr Jan, Corey Sandhagen. And a lot of people thought... It could be fight of the night, and it delivered. Yep, it was fight of the night. Incredible fight. Um, The first two rounds, I thought, were uh, particularly competitive and electrifying. I mean, those exchanges early on were just incredible. And then um, Peter Jan, in classic style, just turns it up in rounds three, four, and five. Um, I mentioned how terrible my prediction was in the main event. I I feel the need to, you know, brag a little bit on this one. I thought I nailed this one pretty well. I thought I said Corey would win one of the first two rounds. And then I said uh, Jan would take over with that experience advantage. And the one thing I was wrong about was I expected Jan to be incorporating a lot more uh, clinch, a lot more maybe takedown attempts, try to grapple Corey. He didn't really do that at all. He was content to break Corey down at his own range, at that distance range. And it was just a masterful fight of, um, you know, the volume puncher, the guy who was trying to feel around Peter Jan's guard, and then the the guy who was coming back with those powerful combinations in Peter Jan. And just Jan is just so much fun to watch. I have him at probably, you know, it's hard to rank the top three fighters, but the top three, I think, no question, are Usman, Volkanovski, and Peter Jan. And I mean, I just I love watching those three guys fight. Um, we just had we we're having them back to back to back pay per views too. So we're getting the three best fighters in MMA on three pay per views in a row, and that's just a real treat. Um, really exciting fight. I nailed the forty nine forty six prediction as well. I've got a bit of a bold prediction over what's going to happen with the bantamweight belt, and I'm going to hear it. I'm going to throw this one out to you. If Aljamain if Aljamain Sterling shows any sign that he's not going to be ready by the UFC's time frame. The next, U- the next Bantamweight title fight will be Piotr Jan versus TJ Dillashaw. Yeah, it all depends on that knee injury from TJ because, you know, I think he did injure his knee in that that um, Sandhagen fight. I thought you were going to say Marab for a second because... I like Marab. Honestly, yeah, I mean, Marab's also Al Jermaine's teammate. Um, I think Al Jermaine is going to be getting back in there, um, you know... His main issue was he apparently couldn't spar past two rounds. He would spar two rounds, and then he would kind of hit a wall. And it seems like he's trying to work through that, going to doctors and whatnot. Hopefully the guy can recover and get back to 100% um, because, you know, that Peter Jan rematch needs to happen. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I I would like to see um, Jan beat TJ and Dom Cruz and you know, Marab and the Aljamain rematch and maybe even Aldo rematch, honestly. I would just like to see Jan beat everyone. So whoever they want to give him, um, 
feed him to him. I would like to see him beat like every former Bantamweight champion. Give him Cejudo and Cruz and TJ. I just want to see Jan beat up everyone. But uh, you really that's wanna, what you're you really want to bring back Hinn and Burrell just for that? <laughs> um, poor poor, yeah, poor I mean, Burrell. Rah, 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 Hinn and Burrell. <laughs> I miss that guy. I think that he's was probably be, the greatest uh, parody song ever made on YouTube, by the way, about MMA, right? I think he's fighting one of the regional shows in November. Mm. Hopefully he's back on those uh, Brazilian supplements that they don't test for in those regional shows because he will need it. I've actually got a Hen and Burrell video coming up in just a few weeks' time, so stay tuned to the main INC channel for that one. Before we do that, though, we need to turn our attention to UFC 268. As mentioned before, we are back in Ma Madison Square Garden first time since 2019. And there is something very special about the MSG shows. We sort of touched on that a little bit earlier on. This is a bit of a strange question, but I'll try and throw it to you, John. Do you think that the, the spectacle of Madison Square Garden and what these events normally mean, do you think this is factored into the title fights at all? That the UFC have chosen the bigger, high-profile names over the more deserving title challenges just because they want a bigger spectacle for MSG. I think it has more so to do with overall ratings and numbers than it does uh, Madison Square Garden. Um, I forget the COO's name or the chief operating officer, whatever the guy's name is, but apparently this guy has been um, influencing a lot of the title fights taking place at, at, in the UFC. These are guys from WME, of course, who a few years ago had no idea about uh, MMA UFC, and now they're kind of dictating who gets the title shots. And that's just the corporate behavior that the UFC is getting accustomed to. Um, you know, 10 years ago, you could win three or four fights in a row, and you'd be getting a title shot pretty much no question. Now, the title shots are given out on a completely random basis. You can be coming off a loss. You can be coming off of getting knocked out in 70 seconds and you get an immediate rematch. So there's no real rhyme or reason to why they're doing these. I just think they they run through some Google Analytics or something like that. They see, oh, Zhang and Colby are trending higher than Leon and Carla. Let's give these guys the title shot. So I think it's more of like a general business um strategy they're going with as as opposed to madison square garden specifically it's a, it, i would certainly agree with that to an extent but i do think though that usman versus colby at msg sounds sexier than usman versus leon edwards at msg yeah i mean i do understand that that angle i definitely think colby probably has a little more interest in leon um but i mean from a fan's perspective, uh, I want to see Leon and Usman fight again. They did fight, you know, way back in the day, 2016. Um, but I think obviously Leon has improved a lot since then. He's gotten that eight or nine fight win streak, and I think there's a lot more like intrigue to the rematch there. Like what's going to happen with these guys in 2021, as opposed to Usman and Covington, who fought less than two calendar years ago. And we will get into the main event in a lot more detail later on in the show. For now, though, we're going to be turning our attention to the prelim fights. You can see those on your screen right now. Are there any particular names that stand out for you when it comes to the prelims? I think the the name that's attracting a lot of casual fans is Alex Pereira. Now, 3-1 record. He's making his UFC debut. So you're thinking, well, this guy's only had four fights. What's the fuss about? It all stems from what he did in kickboxing. He is on record the only man to ever knock out Israel Adesanya. And a lot of people are wondering what can he do to potentially set up a rematch further down the road. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the Adesanya connection is a bit of a pipe dream in terms of MMA. I am extremely doubtful that they ever fight in MMA in a rematch of any kind. I mean... Um, Adesanya, I think, was what, maybe 8 or 9 and 0 before he got to the UFC. He had faced m way more competition, been training MMA a lot longer. And I think his you know, MMA career has has shown that. He's gotten steadily better. He has that good base. Meanwhile, Pereira, I think, has kind of been casually training in MMA, um, you know, working on his grappling over the past few years. And he's taken some easy MMA fights. But if I recall, I think the guy only has one recent uh, MMA fight where he knocked his opponent out, you know, viciously. Um, yep, he knocked uh, an opponent out on LFA back in November of last year. But then before that, I think his last MMA fight was, yeah, 2016. 
So the guy is not fighting consistently in MMA at all. Um, so I think it'll be exciting to see him. Uh, it seems that like the UFC has matched made him pretty well with a with a winnable opponent. Um, but in terms of the future versus Adesanya, I don't think it's going to really materialize. But it's cool to see uh, Alex making his UFC debut. Um, obviously, one of the highest level strikers in the entire world. So it's going to be cool to see him in the UFC octagon. Your knowledge of kickboxing is a lot better than mine. Where would you rank Alex Pereira in mm. terms of where we could stand in terms of kickboxers to MMA transitionees? Is this going to be an Adesanya or is this going to be a Gokhan Saki? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I... I might know a, a, a minuscule amount more than kickboxing about you, but I mean, I don't know that much. I, I don't claim to to know really what I'm talking about. Um, I definitely think he'll be a bit, bit better than Gokan Saki because Saki came in like real late, 35, 36 or something. Pereira's no spring chicken, though. He He's probably, he's 34, you know? So I think the guy will, I think I'll go maybe three and two, something like that. Um, I mean, the guy they're giving him, Misha Delis, is no joke. I mean, the guy is a pretty well-rounded fighter, already has some UFC experience, and you always got to think, if this guy is going to take the fight to the floor, Pereira could, you know, look pretty bad, could lose the fight. So um, if he's match-made right, I think he can pick up a few UFC wins, but I don't think he's going to scratch the top 15, honestly. Uh, potential fights on the prelims to look out for as well. A potentially fun fight between Ali Akinta and Bobby Green. Al's fighting for the first time since, I think, UFC 243. So that's over two yep. years ago since he last fought in the octagon. Big match as well for Edmund Shabazian. He's the only ranked fighter on the prelims. He's lost his last two, admittedly, against guys who exploited a big weakness in his game. And I was checking the bookmakers' odds for this one. Bearing in mind what Shabazian was doing before the Derek Brunson fight, he's coming into the fight against Amarvov as the underdog. Yeah, the market has done a bit of a 180. He was uh, almost a four to one favorite against Derek Brunson in a three round fight and, you know, looked pretty bad there. Um, had some initial success versus Jack Hermanson in round one. But the same issue that has plagued his entire career is that the guy's gas tank is no good. Uh, the Darren Stewart fight he slowed down in. Derek Brunson, and now Jack Hermanson. So that's all three fights where he's really struggled in were all due to gassing out and slowing down pretty heavily halfway into the fight. So the guy's got to work on his cardio. There's no other way around it. And the guy he's fighting, Imavov, is actually a really interesting prospect. Um, the guy's a, a slick boxer. Honestly, probably one of the best boxers at 185 already. And this guy trains with uh, Nganu's camp, or maybe it's Gaines' camp, honestly, out in, uh, you know, they're all affiliated out in France. There's a small scene out there, but this guy looks like a really ex exciting striker, and he just knocked out Ian Heinish in his last fight, too. So really interesting prelim fight. The other fight you mentioned, um, Carl, is going to be I Quinta Green. Very fun fight. Bobby Green's almost never in boring fights. And this is just going to be, you know, a really fun boxing match, honestly, I expect, between these guys. Um, Bobby Green's last fight against Fiziev was fireworks the entire fight. One of the best fights all year, honestly. Um, so I'm always looking forward to Bobby Green. But um, two other prospects I'll mention on the card. Um, guy coming out of, uh, of Ireland fighting at Sanford MMA right now, Ian Gary. He's had some success in Cage Warriors. I'm sure um, the UK scene is hype about this guy. And then one kickboxer. Boxer who I do think will have good success transitioning to MMA, uh, Melsic Bogdazarian um, got his first fight under his UFC uh, contract in uh, a few months ago. Head kick knockout, really exciting fighter. This guy's a slick striker, got incredible southpaw kicks, and this guy's one to look out for. So he's kicking off the uh, the first fight of the night, and uh, you know it just shows that even though. These first six fights aren't the highest level fights. Um, they have some interesting prospects in there. Chris Curtis finally, finally making his UFC debut. So there's some good prelims for this card. And, uh, you know, the two prelims you mentioned specifically, Edmund and Imavov, I Quinta Green, two really good fights that could, you know, honestly be on the main card. So that, that just shows how stacked this card is. I've just noticed as well, everyone's been making a big deal about, like, all of Trevor Whitman's protégés all fighting on the main cards, like Rose, Kamara Usman, Justin Gagey. Both of Edmonds boys fighting on the prelims. Um well oh is yeah, is Bogdazarian a uh yeah, yeah. he's uh Armenian, right? Yes, yeah. That's not a good uh that's not a good sign for Melsic's future career. I hope I hope Melsic's head coach is not Edmund, but I could be wrong. That would be a bad sign for his his career though, honestly. I think 
just to go off on a bit of a tangent, I think Edmund is somebody who he's almost like Kavanaugh. He's a guy who can get guys to a certain level. He can get guys into the UFC. But the limitations as a strategist and as a well-rounded coach start showing the further higher up the totem pole they get. Yeah, they just kind of seem like like yes men, honestly. When when things are going right, they're they're there in the spotlight, you know, wanting to get all the attention. But then when things go wrong, they don't really have the right advice to offer their fighters. They don't really make the necessary adaptations. And you know, I'm not sl- I'm not slandering your queen around a Rousey at all. That's not what I'm doing. But um, yeah, you know, those guys definitely I think are are yes men. They fall into that category. Maybe it's just seeing what happened with Fabio, which sort of makes Edmund and Kavanaugh just look a little bit better in comparison. Yeah, one of, that's one of the most successful videos in INC history, isn't it? I think so, yeah. <laughs> Tell you what, we could be patting each other on the back for the next 20, 30 minutes. We do have a show to get to, and we're going to be starting by talking about the first fight on the main card, and an absolute legend returns to Madison Square Garden. Frankie Edgar takes on Marlon Chito Viva. It's the number 8 seed versus the number 13 seed. It's going to be Edgar's first appearance in the octagon since that brutal knockout to Corey Sandhagen. And a lot of people who maybe believe this is the last time we see Frankie Edgar in the octagon. I don't think it's the last time. Um, I think, you know... There is a top 10, top 15 type of fighter, and if he is able to have any resemblance of a close fight against Vera, then he can win several other fights in the Bantamweight division. So even if he were to lose this fight, I hope, I hope, and the UFC doesn't really do this too much, but I hope they would give Edgar another, you know, easier matchup. Um, they should have done that with a lot of guys, with with Junior, with Overeem, with Damian Maya, these guys who have been in the company for so long, they, they need to throw these guys some softball matchups on their way out. But they're not doing that at all with Edgar here. Vera is, you know, an up and coming guy who's improving fight to fight, and they're they're feeding him right to Edgar here, even though Edgar is forty years old, and he's coming off a bad knockout. Um, so it's kind of merciful or merciless, excuse me, matchmaking um, on on the UFC's end here. I think that's one thing that the UFC of one of the big criticisms I've had with the UFC. Like, if you compare it to Bellator, Bellator get a lot of criticism for their old guy fights, in inverted commas. Mm -hmm. But I would much rather see Rampage fight Vandalay, fight somebody of his same sort of level, rather than using him as bait to build up another big upcoming star. The UFC take the opposite approach. They take guys like Johnny Hendricks, guys who are on their way out, and used him as a disposable, big, high-profile name to feed the Paolo Costas of the world, which I think is a little bit unfair, but it's it's the ruthless nature of the UFC, in my opinion. Yeah, and it seems like Edgar's kind of been playing that role since the Ortega fight, right? I mean, that fight, I think, was thrown together on pretty short notice. It was supposed to be, um, you know, Holloway versus Edgar, um, and then... Some I think a lot of controversy happened there. It was supposed to be Holloway versus Edgar at 218, then Edgar pulled out, and then they gave Ortega at 222. So they kind of been throwing him to the wolves, like Ortega, Korean Zombie, now Chito Vera, Corey Sanhagen. I mean, they're just giving Frank Yeager nonstop, relentless matchups, which is kind of fucked up in my opinion because the guy is a legend of the Octagon, um, almost a two-way world champion, and he, he had a good showing, a good debut at 135 versus Pedro Munoz last year. And so the guy does have st- you know some gas left in the tank. They shouldn't be giving these, this guy such you know difficult matchups. That's one thing that has stood out for me in terms of Frankie Edgar. Yes, he is. He's lost four of his past six. Three of them have come by stoppage. But the one thing that's always stood by Frankie Edgar, even later on into his career, is his conditioning. Like, you watch that Munoz fight for five rounds and he's still going at that same pace. Uh, admittedly, he doesn't have the same sort of darting style that he maybe did back when he was fighting, like, Graham Maynard and BJ Penn, that sort of prime Frankie Edgar of sort of 2011, mm-hmm. 2012. Um, I think he sits down on his punches a lot better than what he maybe used to. We saw that when he fought Chad Mendes. I think if there is a notable thing about Frankie Edgar, which, and this is something that happens with age... Frankie was always very good at knowing what to do when he did get hurt. Like, people say Frankie Edgar had a great chin. I'd argue he was great at knowing what to do when he was in trouble. He was scrambling, Mm -hmm. he was rolling, he was doing enough to buy himself some time until he recovered. 
but because he's older now, because he's slower, he's he's not as effective at doing that as what he's maybe was. We saw that when he fought Brian Ortega, he got rocked when Ortega threw that elbow and he didn't dare want to go to the ground against a jiu-jitsu guy like that. He ended up getting knocked out. We saw the same thing when he got rocked against Korean Zombie. Just doesn't have that same recoverability as he maybe used to. And I think that's something that Cheeto Viva could very well exploit because Cheeto is incredibly dangerous in the clinch. Yeah, th- those are great points. Um, the one I'll give Frankie a little bit of slack because two of those guys were at 145. You know, he just doesn't really um, need to be fighting guys that big nowadays. I mean, the size of the UFC has adapted over the years. Frank Yeager is proof of that. You know, he used to be able to hang around 155, and he can never do that nowadays with the average lightweight size. Um, but he, he surprised me against uh, Pedro Munoz. I wasn't expecting him to look that good. The guy still had a lot left in the tank, still had the five rounds, still looked durable. And, you know, the, the Corey shot, you can't really give him too much uh, criticism for that either. I mean, he just ran on to that one. That would knock out, you know, 99% of the people in this world if it landed clean. Um, but in this fight, I think he's going to have to be wrestling. You know, I think that he's not going to want to keep the fight standing for long periods of time against Cheeto because Cheeto just has such a diverse offense. I mean, I love watching this guy strike. He he switches stances. He attacks the legs, the body, the head. He throws clinch strikes, knees, elbows, punches, kicks. I mean, he mixes it up, honestly, better than almost any fighter in the UFC when he's at that distance striking or even in the clinch, honestly. And the killer instinct on him is just incredible, too. He he can hurt you with strikes and snatch a submission or vice versa. And um, I just I'm a huge Chito Vera fan. And I think Edgar will have some success wrestling because if you look at Vera's career, the guy's been taken down by a lot of people. I mean, like six, seven, eight fighters in the UFC have taken him down. A lot of those guys have had some success keeping him on his back. And um, the guy just simply isn't that great of a wrestler. And when he's on his back, he's a little bit content to play guard, to throw elbows off his back, maybe look for a submission. But that's going to be a bad strategy here against Edgar. Edgar is, um, was at one point known for hitting takedowns and, and using his top game to win fights. He hasn't really leaned on that much since the Yair Rodriguez and, and Jeremy Stevens fight back in 2017. So it's been about four, four and a half years since Edgar has used his grappling to win a fight. But um, if I were thinking his strategy in this fight, it's definitely going to be to use that wrestling. So I think it's a, this fight comes down to do you think Cheeto can stuff those takedowns? Uh, do you think he can get up off his back? And honestly... I think it's big enough of a question to be kind of passing on Chito Vera here. He is the favorite. He is around 62% as the favorite here. I think that's a little bit high with uh, Edgar's wrestling credentials. So um, I think if anybody you're betting on here, I would say, you know, take a little bit of the dog at plus money. If Edgar wrestles here, I think he actually has a good chance to win the fight via decision. I'm glad you said by decision as well, because if I had to make one guarantee in regards to this fight, I can see it going the distance. I don't it's a good think, pick, yeah. I don't think the T- Cheeto V was going to be able to finish Edgar, and Cheeto himself has never been finished in any of his UFC losses. And I don't think Frankie's going to have that sort of submission game or the, the knockout power to be able to change that. So I think it is going to go to decision. I'm going to lean towards Cheeto V to do this one. I will say, though, if this fight had happened, say, 2017, 2018... I would have gone with Frank Yetka to win. Yep. But I think age is caught up to Frank Yetka. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad to see, but it's something that happens to all great fighters. Me too, yeah. I'm going same pick, Cheeto decision. I think Edgar will get a takedown, probably win round one, but round two, those takedowns are going to be a lot harder to come by, and I think that Cheeto will start you know, escaping those takedown attempts, start doing damage, and I do agree with your decision pick. If anybody is finishing this fight, it's Cheeto. I agree that Edgar, his chances of finishing seem pretty uh, minuscule, so um you know, I'll be I'll be cheering for Cheeto. I just think it'll be better for the division if Cheeto keeps uh, ascending and keeps uh, you know going up, getting bigger fights. So um, fun, very fun fight uh, to kick off the card. And I will say as well, I think the UFC are very high on Cheeto Vera. If you look at a lot of the guys he's been fighting recently, you can tell that. Well, they gave him Jose Aldo. They gave him jo- Aldo last year, which for me is a mm. sign that they see a lot in him. He's he's in a bit of an awkward position where he doesn't really have the name value that the bigger names want to fight him. But he's so dangerous that if somebody does get put in with him, 
he's going to cause them a hell of a truckload of problems. Yeah, I mean, that that, uh, that O'Malley fight really, you know, boosted his stock big time. I mean, it's crazy to think that he was a plus 250 underdog in that fight against Sean O'Malley. And, you know, we'll probably see that rematch down the line at some point. So, yeah, I'm excited that Cheeto is getting this push. Shows what talking a big match can do for you. Yeah. Yeah, and, be, and just being, you know, a cool tattooed guy from Ecuador in general is just, you know, a boost. Fight number two, and we're going up to the featherweight division now. Uh, this was originally supposed to be Luke Rockhold versus Sean Strickland. Rockhold, unfortunately, mm. got injured, so Strickland has been removed from that card. Taking its place is, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a lower profile match, but it's one that has a lot of intrigue behind it. It's Shane Burgos, the number 14 seed. He's taking on Billy Quarantillo, so two Northeast guys getting a bit of a showcase match at Madison Square Garden, which gets my thumbs up. And with Shane Burgos, it's an interesting situation for him. Two-fight losing streak. He lost to Josh Emmett, and then he lost at UFC 262, I think, up against Edson Barboza. And even though he was on the receiving end of two losses for those fights, I still feel he came out of the matches with his stock high. Is it safe to say that? Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, you know, I think it maybe lessened a little bit coming off that that Barbosa knockout, but I think the the circumstances around that, the way he like randomly collapsed in that fight, I think that kind of you know boosted his stock more than if he just got traditionally knocked out. You know what I mean? I think people had a little bit of sympathy for the way he he fell there. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited for this fight. Two high action fighters. I mean, you can go through and watch these guys UFC fights. There, there are no boring ones. These guys, I think, are just pathologically aggressive, and they're pretty incapable of being in boring fights. So I'm really excited the UFC is recognizing that, putting them on this pay per view main card, and uh, you know, Burgos especially getting that that push in his home state. I don't. Is Billy also from New York? I don't. I, think I don't he know about might that be, one. I think he might be New Jersey. Uh, no, it says it says he was born in, in New York. So yeah, um, I think he I think he lives in Florida now though. Um, but yeah, good to see these New York guys getting this push. Just in an incredible matchup. I can almost guarantee this fight will be exciting. Let's start with Shane Burgos, thirteen and two, um, thirteen and three, I should say. Of course, his last fight was the loss to Edson Barboza. Notable wins including Cub Swanson and Charles Rosa. Uh, was known for his first round knockouts quite early on in his regional career. He tends to go to the third later on. Um, which is obviously a sign of the increased durability and the skill set of guys fighting in the UFC. Big thing that stands out for me, he is a fantastic boxer, especially the way he works the body. We saw that with the way he beat Amir Khani. Uh, good jab at Reigns. But the big weak link which has stood out when he fought Calvin Cater, when he fought Edson Barboza, when he fought Josh Emmett, very poor with striking defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you brought up a lot of good points. The the body shots, the jab of him. He is an extremely skilled boxer, but the guy could work on his defense a little bit. He's a little too comfortable with getting hit. Um, I think that the guy is incredibly durable, even though he did get knocked out in that last fight. Um, the guy's just been in wars throughout his career. And he, like I said, is just a little bit too comfortable in those brawling exchanges. He needs to smarten up his defense a little bit. The guy does have good defensive fundamentals. Um, he just needs to stick with that defense a little bit more, really focus on not getting hit, because that durability is not going to last forever. Um, but both these guys are extremely durable. Quarantillo, also extremely tough, has been um, you know, hurt with some shots, eaten a lot of damage, and kept fighting. And Quarantillo has nonstop cardio. I mean, this guy has several round three finishes. I think three in the UFC alone, one in the Contender Series, and then two in the actual UFC. And um, his other fight against Carlisle, he lost round one, took over round two and three. I mean, this guy is known for just having an, an unlimited gas tank. So in a fight where Quarantillo, I expect to be a little bit outmatched. I think that uh, Burgos is a little bit cleaner in the boxing a little more experienced at this high level. Quarantillo's incredible durability and incredible cardio is going to make this fight close because he's going to be there for the full, full 15 minutes in Burgos' face the entire time. And if anybody is hitting takedowns in this fight, I think it's going to be Quarantillo. I think he's um, more used to offensive wrestling, a little bit better at you know keeping position. Burgos isn't a bad grappler at all, but if anyone is initiating a takedown here, maybe getting some brief takedowns, I expect it to be Quarantillo. So the odds for this one, um, I think it's the biggest favorite, no, the second biggest favorite on the main card. 
Burgos at as minus 200, Quarantillo plus 175. I'll side with the dog at plus 175. I just think he's going to be there the entire time. Um, it's not going to go away. And I think he'll just be in Burgos' face making the fight closer than 65% indicates. So um, I'm expecting you know a high-intensity um, back-and-forth decision. I guess I'll pick Burgos to slightly edge the decision, but... Um, you know, either guy getting finished in the third round wouldn't surprise me either. These guys are known for finishing late. I'm expecting Quarantillo to utilize his wrestling. I think he's got a great scrambling ground game. Um, and I think if he tries getting into a striking match with Shane Burgos, even though he did get that knockout against Kyle Nelson and that sort of went viral because of just how quick it was, I just think Burgos is... A few steps ahead when it comes to the striking game. I do think Quarantillo is going to try and put on a lot of pressure. But if it does become a kickboxing match, I'm favoring Burgos to get it done. So I'm going to go against you. I think that Shane Burgos is going to have the striking advantage. And I think he's going to be able to get it done. I'm going to say second round. Really nice. Yeah, I think, like I said, official pick, I'll still go Burgos. Um, but, uh, you know... I'll go, I'll go decision, but yeah, you know, good reads on this fight by you. Like you said, quarantine is wrestling. Um, you, you had that, you know, in your mind before I even said it. So, uh, you know, we're seeing the fight pretty similarly. Um, incredible fight though. I certainly saw. Would you argue as well that quarantine is maybe a bit pillow fisted? Um, I think the guy's actually been showing a little pop in his punches lately. He dropped uh, Benitez with the right hand in round one um, uh, of their most recent fight. So I think he might be developing a little bit of a little bit of power behind his strikes. Uh, you know, focusing on his strength and conditioning a little bit more. Um, and you know, you got a question. Burgos coming off that weird knockout where you know his legs gave out on him. He's in constant wars. You know, is that chin going to hold up mm. forever? Good point. Um, because he's he's coming off of just war after war. The the Josh Emmett and the the Barboza man. I hope he's taking enough time off and he he's okay. I could see a move to lightweight on the cards for Shane Burgos because he is a he's, massive he's featherweight. Huge. I have no idea how this guy makes. Yeah, they they mentioned that in his last fight against Barboza. They said, look at Burgos's back, and this guy's shoulders, his traps are just inhumanely large for a one forty five er. He looks like Sean Brady, honestly. Fight number three coming up now. Uh, you just mentioned before there you were talking about whether or not these two guys were pillow fisted, big punches, that sort of thing. No arguing whether or not these two guys are big punches. There's nothing else we can say. Justin Gagey, Michael Chandler, it's finally happening. Another insane matchup and talk about no easy matchups for, for Michael Chandler. I mean... Uh, obviously, he was a highly touted guy coming into the UFC, former Bellator champion, but they're just giving him no easy fights, just top five after top five opponent. Um, and they're feeding him again to get you here. You know, you, what do you think about this, Carl? I mean, they 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 had Chandler come in with a lot of hype. They invested, you know, some money into him, obviously. Um now he's coming off of a loss, and they're throwing him right in there against Gaethje. Uh You you think that's a bit of a risky, potentially dumb move? I think the way I look at it from the UFC's perspective is Michael Chandler is 35 years old. So he's exiting mm. the sort of prime of his career. So I think it's a case where the UFC, almost similar to what they did with Vandalay when Vandalay came over, they knew they had a short window to try and get the most out of him. So they're putting him in as many big matches against high profile names as they can. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense to me. I hadn't thought about it that way, but yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, from this matchmaking perspective, it seems like the UFC is is ruthless to Chandler. Like, they're, 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 it seems like they're trying to put Gaethje over a little bit, maybe, here, in my opinion. So are you all sort of leaning towards Justin Gaethje to maybe get this one? Um. So, yeah, the matchup uh, I'll we'll talk about, I mean... Both these guys, you know, like you said, incredible hitters. Um, one guy right off the bat is more durable than the other. Gaethje is known for, you know, being extremely tough. Had that war with Poirier. Eventually did get knocked out in that fight, but um, has been in just constant wars throughout his career and has shown, you know, elite durability. On the other hand, Chandler, not so much. This guy has um, been hurt several times in his career. Most notably got knocked out in his last fight against Oliveira, a fight that he was winning. And, you know, it just all slipped through his fingers. He had that knockdown. He was winning round one. He was having all the momentum. He was a big favorite in the live betting lines. And then, you know, a few 
punches, a left hook from Oliveira puts him to sleep. Um, and we also saw Chandler have some issue with calf kicks. Remember his fight back, uh, Brent Primus back in the day, he got his calf kicked real hard in that fight and his, his, you know, nerve shut down where we see guys legs give out from those calf kicks. So, you know, those are two huge weapons of Gagey, his, his potent boxing and his hard leg kicks, um, especially to the calf for in the orthodox versus orthodox matchup. So in the striking here, I think, it favors Justin Gaethje pretty heavily, like like 70%, I think, is what I would give him the advantage on the feet. Um, I just think he's more durable. He's a little bit better in terms of boxing of fundamentals and technique. And that leg kick is just going to be a huge weapon with how heavy Chandler is on his lead leg. Um, I think that Gaethje's going to win the striking pretty emphatically here. Then it becomes a, a question of, is Chandler going to use his wrestling to try to get this fight and make it closer? Um, what do you think about uh, Chandler's chances of wrestling here, Carl? I think that's the avenue he's going to try and go down, bearing in mind what happened with Justin up against Khabib. And it's it's quite sad to me. It's inevitable, but at the same time sad, the way the narrative has shifted around Gagey because the big point that people made about Gagey was, oh, Gagey's a D1 wrestler himself. He's got fantastic takedown defense. And that was the big sort of narrative going into the Khabib fight. After what happened there... A lot of people have said, all you need to do is take Justin Gagey down and you're going to get yourself an easy win. So I'm going to be interested to see. I expect Chandler to wrestle a lot in this fight. But I, I would like to see whether or not that new narrative of Gagey sticks after this matchup. Yeah, and I agree that that's going to be his path. Um, I think that people are going to overreact to the Gagey fight uh, against Khabib. Um you know, I do think that the Gaethje, he was doing the right things on the feet in that fight. But when he was taken down, I mean, he was just spazzing out. I mean, very, very defensively void, um, giving up his back. I mean, to prepare for Khabib for so long, he obviously was spending the majority of his time focusing on the striking exchanges and how that would go. But you also got to prepare for worst case scenario if you do get taken down. And, you know, a guy, I've said this before, the guy who did the, the best with this was Conor McGregor, honestly. He fought very conservative on bottom. He, you know, was extremely defensive, didn't try to do too much, and did a good job at prolonging that finish while guys like Poirier and Gaethje just, you know, got up really recklessly and gave Khabib the the, tr the transitions and scrambles that he wanted, and he eventually got that submission. So I don't think that Gaethje's going to look that bad on the ground here, um, especially in the wrestling. The pure wrestling exchanges, I think Gaethje can still compete. It's just where that elite jujitsu comes in with the, uh, the, the, the wrestling that Khabib has that the Chandler's not going to have. But if you look at... Chandler's recent fights, his past five fights, I don't think the guy shot a takedown one time. I think that um, the Pitbull fight, he got knocked out right away. He knocked out Outlaw in round one, knocked out Henderson in round one, knocked out Hooker in round one, hurt Chandler or hurt uh, Oliveira and ended up on top. But he actually, I don't think, has hit a takedown since the Brent Primus fight in 2018. So it's not like this guy is a wrestler who wrestles in every fight. He, you know, wrestles time, from time to time. And it seems like the guy's kind of falling in love with his boxing, you know, so. His strategy really matters in this fight. If he focuses on wrestling, he has a chance to win. But if he thinks that he can hang in these striking exchanges with Gaethje, I think he's going to be rudely awakened by that calf kick and by those hands of Justin Gaethje. So I'll be picking Gaethje here. It's just a matter of whether it's going to be knockout or decision. I don't know if Gaethje has ever won a decision. But with this fight being three rounds, with Chandler being a wrestler, I could see this one actually making it to the decision. So, um... You know, I'm picking. What are you thinking for your official pick here, uh, Carl? Well, I've actually got the stats here of, of Justin Gage's 22 wins. 20 of them have come in the distance, 19 by knockout. So there's only wow. two times that he's ever gone the distance in the fight, and that was pre UFC. Um, mm -hmm. I think with Michael Chandler, you sort of touched on it there. He does have the wrestling in his back pocket, but it's very similar to what happened with. I think Chad Mendes is a great comparison. Chad Mendes would often use the threat of the takedown mm. to set up his striking. And that fits Chandler to a T. That big overhand right, the same one that caught Dan Hooker, that's what he's going to try and aim for. And I think in terms of power for power, I would say Chandler is the more powerful of the two. But the big improvement that Justin Gagey has made, I would say ever since the 
ever since the Dustin Poirier fight, when he went on that four fight winning streak, his big improvement has been his footwork and avoiding taking damage. So I think Gagey has enough that he's going to avoid the big right hands. And if Gagey does catch him, and Gagey can crack as well, people forget that, I can see Chandler crumbling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I will go with knockout as well. I just think that the, the, the weapons of Gagey, the calf kick, and the punches are going to be um, too much. And, and I just can't trust the durability of Chandler because... Um, you know, Oliveira is making leaps and bounds improvements in his striking, but he's not really dropping guys with hands too often. And he dropped Chandler in that fight after getting hurt himself, too. So I just can't trust Chandler to make it the full 15 minutes. But um, the betting line for this one, you know, pretty surprised to see Justin Gaethje near in a two to one favorite here. I mean, it seems like betters are, are, are taking Justin Gaethje um, pretty heavily. So I think that might be a little bit wide at this point. Um you know, I think people still got to throw a little bit of respect on Chandler's name. I certainly agree with that. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens to Michael Chandler after this fight. Because when then you've got yourself the possibility of him fighting, what, Makachev probably, Benil Dariush, fighting somebody around Ooh. that sort of top five. If he loses, then there's going to be a lot of questions because that's one win out of, his, out of three in the UFC. And then you're going to have people wondering... Did the UFC just waste their money on this guy? It's 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 a fickle business. Yeah, I mean, I think I would give him just someone outside of the top ten. I mean, Michael Chandler versus Bobby Green next or something like that. That would be real fun. So they just got to give him a step down. Um, if he loses this fight, I still think he's got some some wins left in the tank. Call main event time, and we are going down to the UFC strawweight division. The first of two title rematches taking place on this card. And we're going back to UFC 261. Rose Namajunas making the first event of her second reign as UFC strawweight champion. And she's starting off this second reign the same way she did her first one. She's going to be taking on the former champion in a rematch. In this case, it's China's Zhang Weili. So, I'm going to go back to something you said at UFC 265 when the rumours about Rose versus Weili rematching came up. Now, this is your words quote for quote. If they give the next title shot to Zhang, we need to riot. We need to go to the <laughs> UFC headquarters with Carla Vespaza t-shirts saying you fucked up. First questions first, John. Did you buy those plane tickets and did you buy the t-shirts? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're we're booked and ready to go. We'll, we will be protesting all week. I'm leaving right after the podcast and hopping on the plane. I've actually got a, a Carla Esparza tattoo across my chest, honestly. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know... Our hearts are heavy on the INC Live podcast right now. Our girl Carla Esparza did get screwed. Um, just finished Jan Shannon. Um, I think Jan was undefeated in the UFC. Five fight win streak. Jan, uh, Carla dominates her, mauls her, finishes her. Seems clear cut that she's going to be the next in line for the title. Um, Rose and, and Esparza fought way back in 2014 or something like that. It would be a great, great story. But, you know, the UFC doesn't give us what we want. They go with the the analytics. They say that, that Zhang has more fans, that, that she's getting more attention. So they're going with Zhang in the rematch. But I hate it. I think it's stupid. Uh, I understand the Joanna rematch back in the day when um, Joanna was a 7-1 to favorite, had defended her belt five or six times, and gets knocked out in round one. Okay, I understand the immediate rematch. But Zhang, who had won one title defense which was a dodgy split decision that she honestly lost if we're being honest and for her to get head kicked in 70 seconds i mean every time i watch that fight i'm amazed about how soon it was into the fight 70 seconds and they're giving her another chance i mean when you get knocked out in 70 seconds i think that you need to prove yourself a little bit more before you get an immediate title shot i mean this is this is silly i have to be honest i've i've been I've been slightly enamored by the fan reaction to sort of Carla because you see a lot of the posts promoting Whaley versus Rose 2. You're getting a lot of people saying it should have been Carla, it should have been Carla, that sort of thing. It sort of reminds me a little bit of when Damian Meyer got the title shot in 2017. A lot of people admit, yeah, I don't really like his fighting style. I think he's a bit boring. But seven fight winning streak, he deserves it. And if, in my opinion... Carl is getting that same sort of treatment. Yes, people might find him a little bit dull, a little bit boring, but 
they're recognizing, hey, this person deserves it. I mean, it's the same scenario as the main event. Uh, Leon Edwards, uh, I believe, is what, eight or nine fight win streak? Um, you know, came off the Nate Diaz fight. Um, you know, you thought that that would be the perfect opportunity to high roll Edwards into the title shot. He got some exposure. He got the win over Nate Diaz in pretty dominant fashion outside of one moment. And they just don't really follow up on that. I, I don't get it. They they don't know how to build momentum. I, I don't. I mean, Colby fought. Now, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that in, in 10 minutes. But we'll talk about uh we'll keep it to Zhang Rose for now. Um, my my prediction the first time I was picking Rose the first time. I thought that she was going to win rounds one and two. You know, she's a fast starter. She comes out with that that dynamic offense, especially her good boxing. I thought she was going to win the first two rounds, maybe slow down a bit in round three and four. And then I thought she was going to come back to win one of the later rounds, round four, round five, and, and win a, a close decision, kind of like how she, the fight exactly played out against Joanna the second time. But, you know, Rose didn't even need that much time. She she head kicked her in 70 seconds, um, pretty much the first meaningful strike of the fight that landed, like you mentioned. And I just think that that, you know, really obviously, besides the obvious, that the, the Rose won the fight. I think that, that that really proved a lot of good things for Rose going forward. One of Zhang's best qualities was her durability. She had taken, you know, huge shots throughout her career, especially in the Joanna fight. Just showed elite durability and cardio there. And then that durability was kind of, you know, that facade of that elite durability, that juggernaut type of thing that Zhang had going, that was all erased by one head kick from Rose. And, you know, Rose didn't even get to start throwing hands. She didn't even get to start using her boxing. So who knows how those striking exchanges would have gone. I think that those would have favored Rose too. So I'm still favoring Rose going into this matchup, honestly. It's hard to do. Obviously, the fight only lasted just over a minute. But is there anything that we can see from the first fight that gives us an indicator how this one might go? Um, One thing is... What Zhang was trying to do is she was trying she was thinking that the inside leg kick was coming from from Rose and she tried moving her leg back as if the, the, the leg kick was coming, but it was actually coming up to the head and you know she got decapitated there by by Rose in round one. I don't think there was enough in that sample size to really predict what's gonna happen in this one. Um you know, we, like I said, we didn't even really get to see them land any punches. It was still a feeling out process and the fight ended, you know pretty abruptly so um i'm not you know uber confident in rose i'm not you know saying she's a lock in this fight at all but she is the slight underdog right now um you know different books have her at different lines bet online the most reputable one does have her as a slight underdog right now but the odds in the first fight were zhang minus 200 minus 215 which is about 65 percent and now she's all the way down to 51, 52%. So big change in the odds there. One of the things that a lot of people are anticipating, based on the fact that Whaley is now training with Henry Cejudo, is a lot of people are reading into that and thinking that Whaley's going to try and utilize more of a wrestling game. Do you think oh that's maybe goodness. a... Hell no. I mean, uh, what, what can Henry Cejudo really teach Whaley Zhang? I mean... I know that they're, they're both, you know, good fighters. I just I just don't think that Cejudo is really capable of, of, of teaching that much and having that much of an influence. Um, I mean, Zhang does have some decent trip takedowns. She gets the fight into the clinch, can hit some takedowns from there. I think she hit some on Tisha Torres, if I'm correct. Um, but I don't think she has great like, wrestling fundamentals. She kind of just uses her strength to, to trip opponents down to the canvas. But I don't think that's going to be an issue for, for Rose here. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think wrestling is going to come into play. And if it does go to the ground as well, a lot of people forget Rose is a very good submission expert. Yeah, you know, very good. Yeah, good off her back, good on top. She 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 mauled, uh, I think, Watterson and maybe even Van Zant back in the day on, on, on top. Um, so yeah, don't don't forget that Rose is skilled everywhere. And you know, it's it's really hard to say too much more about this fight just because we we had all, all those you know feelings coming into the first fight, and then they were all cut short in just seventy seconds. And uh, I'm picking Rose again to win here. I'm not sure how she's going to do it. I'm not sure if it's going to be another finish uh, or if it's going to be a decision this time. I definitely think the fight's going to last longer than it did the first time. Um, 
And, you know, I hope Rose's cardio holds up. You know, she had a little bit of trouble in round three versus Andrade, but was still able to win that fight. And I think that that win is aging well. I mean, she outboxed Andrade for the first two rounds. She won a 29-28 decision there pretty comfortably. Um, and I think that her, I think that, you know, she's going to have all this confidence going into this fight. She's the champion again. She's got that belief in herself. And I just think her confidence and she's going to be in all time great shape. And, you know, I'm picking Rose to get it down. Not sure about the outcome. Um, whether it's going to be, I'll go decision just because that seems, you know, likely it's a women's fight. Um, I'll go Rose decision. What about you? Have you maybe been a bit concerned by the way that Whaley reacted to the loss? Um, honestly, I, I didn't pay too, that much attention to it. What, what did she say? A lot of it was implying that she thought that she was basically implying that Rose sort of riled up the crowd and she got the crowd on her side and she was a bit put off by the booze and... Yeah, I mean, this is the fight game, sweetheart. You can't be, you can't be, you know claiming you lost because the fans were, were were booing you um i don't i don't buy into that i also don't buy that like zhang actually said that i feel like that was probably like a loss in translation type mm -hmm. of thing or her coach said it you know like zhang doesn't strike me as the type of a woman to complain like that she in probably was oh, i just got caught you know I'll, I'll do better next time in terms of my own personal perspective i think we're going to get something very similar to rose versus Joanna too I think the Whaley is going to close up a lot of the mistakes that she made in the first fight. I can see mm -hmm. it being a sort of a much sort of dirtier, grittier fight. Whaley obviously being a lot more competitive. I can see her finding most of her success in the middle round. But Rose does have Trevor Whitman on the side. She's very good at sort of reading the, how the fight game goes. And I see her getting the unan unanimous decision. So I think it's going to be whether it's 4-1 or 3-2, I'm not entirely sure, but I am going for Rose to win this one. I like that. I like the pick. I like the comparison. Yeah, that, you know, she finished Joanna the first time. The second fight was much closer, extremely competitive, but Rose still proved that she was better. And I think that's what will happen here. Um, and then real quick, in terms of bets, I, I feel like if you want to bet Zhang here, you might as well just wait until round one, until round two. I think that Rose will start fast again. She will get off to an early lead. Maybe Zhang is able to come back and, and make the fight close with her durability, her cardio. But I don't think that Zhang is going to ha start having real success until like seven to ten minutes in. So betting-wise, this one, Rose is the pre-fight side and looked a live bet of Zhang if she's doing all right. Just one final note before we move on to our main event here. Uh, when we did the first poll for UFC 261, uh, Whaley was given 62% uh, prediction to win from the voters. So 62 for Whaley and 38 for Rose. This time around, bearing in mind it was, what, one minute of action and it was only one meaningful strike, that has swung the other way by 39%. So Rose Namajunas comes into this one, I believe, as a, just doing my maths here, as a 66% favourite. Yeah, and you know it's a rightful correction, but I'll give the uh, the INC listeners some credit. I mentioned it earlier. Zhang was minus two hundred the first time. That puts her chances at sixty six percent, and you know the fans had her at sixty two percent, so they had the fight closer than the odds did, and you know they ended up being right on that one. So um, hopefully they're right on this one. I'd like I'd like to see Rose uh, win the fight. I'd like to see the Carla rematch after this. Yeah, just doing the just actually just doing a little bit of math again here. It just shows I was never any good at math. Uh, Whaley's <laughs> prediction right now is uh, 23%, so 77% of people picking Rose to win this one. Wow, yeah. Um, breaking news, everyone. Carl can't uh, subtract. <laughs> one of my big weaknesses, I'm afraid. <laughs> Time for us to talk about our main event of the evening, and we're going up to the UFC Wealth Weight Division. It's another rematch. It's Kamaru Usman who is taking on the number one ranked Colby Covington. A rematch nearly two years in the making. The first match took place at UFC 245. Now, I have to hold my hands up for this one. If you go back and you watch the 245 preview show, I was not enthusiastic for this fight. I thought, we've got two guys who aren't really all that likable. They're both primarily wrestling-based. I just thought we were going to get ourselves quite a dull, unworthy main event. Kamara Usman vs. Colby Covington, UFC 245, completely proved me wrong. It was a fantastic matchup. We get to run it back. The question is, should we, bearing in mind what Colby has, or in this case hasn't done, to warrant the title fight? 
I mean, yeah, since the first fight, Colby has just been so active, knocking off top contender after top contender. I mean, he's really just solidified himself as one of the most active fighters in the game. You know, wait, wait a minute. Oh, I forgot. Never mind. He's only had one fight against the ghost of Tyron Woodley. Um, and, you know, that was over a year ago. That was in September of 2020. And here we are 14 months later with this guy, no fights, and he's getting a title shot. I don't understand that logic at all. Um, I mentioned it earlier in the podcast, Leon Edwards. Uh, these guys, uh, Camaro and Leon fought um, six years ago. The fight was, you know, extremely competitive. And um, actually, you know, I was, I, you know, Usman won the fight very decisively, but the wrestling is honestly pretty competitive. Like, Leon handled himself really well in that fight, and if you haven't seen it, you should go watch that fight. Leon Edwards, though, since then, nine-fight win streak over five years. Uh, coming off the Nate Diaz win, I thought it was kind of a no-brainer that he would get the next title shot, but it doesn't seem like that's the direction they went in. They're matching uh, Jorge and Leon up, which is pretty cool. Uh, that does kind of soften the blow, you know. At least if Leon is getting screwed out of his title shot, at least they're giving him another high-profile fight. If you need an example, just you highlighted it there about Colby's inactivity. I was looking through some stats. If you look at the UFC welterweight top 15 right now, Colby hasn't got a win over anybody else ranked in the top 15. Doesn't really shock me. I mean, I think this guy has been extremely overrated throughout his career. Um, the guy's obviously a great athlete, incredible gas tank, great cardio, um, great wrestler. Um, and I think he is a good fighter overall. I just don't think he is particularly elite in any one area. And I think that his, his striking is just a little bit too basic. I mean, I think the guy, um, just doesn't really make much improvements in his striking. He has the southpaw stance. He throws out the one, two, he throws out a lot of punches, the bo a body kick from here and there, but I don't see a lot of varied offense in his game. I don't see him really sitting down on his punches and, in the Kamara Usman fight, he really proved that he's not really a, a defensively great fighter either. He kept getting hit with the same strikes, the same straight right to the body, the same straight right hand down the middle. And I just don't think that Colby Covington's striking defense is that that good. And he's going to be getting hit here by Usman, just like he was in the first fight. And unfortunately for Colby, since that first fight, it seems like Usman has gotten a hell of a lot better. Um, I think that's been proven in his past few fights. You know, he went to the de decision with Masvidal initially, rematched him and knocked him out. He knocked out Gilbert Burns. And I just think this guy has been clearly leveling up in his his boxing, his his striking, his power. And I just think Usman is probably at his all-time best right now. He's hitting harder than ever. And, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and get my prediction right off the bat. The last fight, I was expecting to be more competitive in the first fight, the Zhang and Rose fight. I, I'm expecting the fight on Saturday to be much closer than their first fight. This fight, Colby versus Usman, I'm expecting to be less competitive in their first fight. I think that Usman's going to knock him out quicker than he did the first fight. I've heard someone describe Colby Covington striking as irritating in terms of there isn't like one big power punch that he throws that's going to knock you down. It's just constant pitter pattering all the time. Left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand. And it just so it winds people up. I think we saw that probably best when he fought Robbie Lawler, where just Robbie mm. just couldn't get anything going because Colby was just on him all the time. So I give Colby a little bit more credit than what you do. I do think he's a better fighter than some people maybe want to admit. Obviously, bearing in mind he's got the whole shtick, he's got this sort of love to hate panto body role. I think because of that, a lot of people don't give Colby Covington the credit he maybe deserves. One of the things I will say in regards to this fight, though, is you can make an argument going into 245 that Colby entered that fight as the A-side. That was at the time when his shtick was in full swing. It was mm -hmm. irritating a lot of people. And he came into that show as sort of like the big panto body up against Kamara Usman, who was just seen as the boring, dull wrestler. This time around, though... Colby Stick doesn't have the same impact. He's been very inactive. And Kamara Usman during that time has completely transformed his perception. So you could argue going into this fight, Usman is now the A side. Yeah. It's kind of like uh like pro wrestling. Like he was the the fans were behind the heel the first time, and now they the rematch, they've kind of done a 180, and now the fans will probably be behind the face in Usman here. Um 
and I, I'm glad to see it. I mean, remember that promo? I think it was after um, Covington beat Woodley. He was like, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you the next time I see you. I mean, it was just so pathetic that, 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 you know, you have all this time to prepare for this promo. Um, you know, the guy claims he's, he's, you know, good on the microphone and he's screaming, I'm going to kill you. Like, it's just the worst promotion the worst trash talk i could possibly imagine um and you know one thing you said about uh colby you know i think you think he's a little bit better people think he's worse than he is because of the shtick i think his fans think he's better than he is because of the shtick too they, they you know they like his personality they like the 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 trump stuff that he says and then they think he's better because of that but like you said the 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 proof is there. No top wins in the uh, no wins in the top fifteen. There's no nothing that can dispute that. You know, I guess Robbie Lawler is the closest thing to a top fifteen win he has. And we saw how weak Rob, Robbie Lawler looked against Nick Diaz. Uh, you said weak? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I it was okay. Was a it was okay, but it was a sign that Robbie Lawler isn't the same fighter he was. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, looking at his resume, uh, Colby, in the past few years outside of the RDA fight, which a lot of people out there believe that Colby actually lost that fight, um, you know, outside of that fight, that's probably his most impressive performance in the past, you know, three or four years. Yeah, since the guy's been extremely inactive, one fight a year for pretty much, you know, three or four years in a row. Um, but uh, w what are your th thoughts on the prediction for this one, Carl? What are you going with? I'm leaning in a similar boat to yourself. I think that Kamara Usman has made some big improvements in terms of his striking. And that was a very competitive kickboxing match between Usman and Colby first time around. But considering how active Colby's been and how good Usman's striking has now gotten, I think Colby's taking a big chance if he tries to use the same strategy he did first time around. If he tries that sort of pitter-patter, irritating, punching style, he's going to get wiped out by Usman. Where mm -hmm. I think Colby's going to have the best chance, and this might surprise a lot of people, I wouldn't be surprised if Colby tries wrestling. A big mm -hmm. reason why Usman has switched things up recently is because he's commented a lot that his knees aren't the same as they were back in his wrestling days. He's not as comfortable going for takedowns. If Colby yeah. tries exploiting that, and he's the one pushing the pace, trying to go for the takedowns, I can see him getting a lot of success. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be the best strategy from him. Um, going into this first fight, I spent you know a lot of time researching and talking about how the grappling exchanges would play out, and I was predicting that Usman, you know, would be the better of the two in those exchanges, kind of based on the RDA fight where RDA was able to stand up from a lot of takedowns, was able to reverse and hit his own takedowns, and I thought that Usman would win the wrestling, and then you know. Like it fooled us all. The fight didn't have any wrestling or grappling take place uh, throughout the entire fight. It was pretty much entirely kickboxing. Um, and the first fight was close. Make no mistake about it. It was. It could have been three one. Either guy could have been two two. They were close rounds. But, and I think a lot of people are, are thinking, oh, the first fight was close. This fight will be close too. But if you look in round five, when you look at the shots that did damage and did the attritional damage. It was Colby who was slowing down from the body shots. It was Colby who started bleeding and started, you know, had his jaw hurt or whatnot. It was Usman's strikes that were the ones doing accrued damage in the fight. Sure, Colby was landing. He landed hundreds of strikes. But were they doing long-term damage to Usman? No, they weren't. Um, and that was evident because Usman was fresh in round five. He still had plenty of gas left, and it was just extremely evident that Usman was the harder hitter of the two. And since then, the guy's gotten his boxing even better. He's hitting even harder, and he knocked him out in the first fight. I just think it's going to take even less time to knock him out this fight. And I'm going to be going with a round three prediction for an Usman knockout. Um, that's going to be my pick. What about you, Carl? You've read my mind. I was going to go third round as well for the same reasons. <laughs> Yeah, All I right, think first that, half, first half of round three or second half. We gotta we gotta find a way to disagree to see who's right next week. Second. <laughs> okay, okay. I got first yeah. then. I just <laughs> think that the the level of quality that Kamara Usman is now really striking to is gonna be too much for Colby. And unless Colby does change things up and my inkling is that he's not, then mm -hmm. I, I see it I think it's gonna be a long night for Colby. And a lot of the fans on the opinion polls agree with that as well. I think First time these two fought, he was very close with the opinion polls. Usman 54%, Colby 46 
this time around, uh, Kamara Usman has, I'm going to try and get my mouse, maths right here for this one, has, I believe, a 74% chance of winning this one. So Kamara Usman, mm. 74, Colby, 26. So you said he had 56 the first time? Uh, 54 first time around for Usman. Mm, wow. That's close. Yeah, I mean, the odds were wider than that. I think he was, I think he was closer to like 57, 58% in the odds. So, um, you know, that fight, that fight played out close. I think a lot of people, like I said, are looking at this fight uh, to think it's going to be a similar dynamic to that fight. It's just Kobe hasn't done anything since then. He's beaten the ghost of Tyron Woodley. That's not impressive. Jake Paul just did that. Um, and I, I've just seen clear improvements from Usman. I think the guy's clearly leveling up. I don't think he's really reaching um, his ceiling yet. Like you said, he had, does have some athletic problems with his knees, but I haven't seen any signs of slowing down. So I see no reason to pick against Usman. The guy is a tank. I love watching him fight, and I think he's knocking Colby out here in round three, um, as late as round four. And if Kamara Usman was to win this fight, and this might be a bit of a controversial subject I'm going to bring up here, if Usman wins this fight, where do we start ranking him in terms of great world weight fighters? Like, I'm not mm. maybe putting him as GSP. I think GSP will probably be number one for a long, long time. But are we maybe putting him ahead of, say, Matt Hughes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's already ahead of Matt Hughes. GSP is the only guy who, who competes with him. Um, you know, Hughes was good at the time, but, I mean, the MMA has just evolved so much since then to the point where i don't think hughes would even be in the top 15 at this point uh i mean may, maybe i'm being a little bit harsh um but i just think that mma has evolved so much that that he's already surpassed hughes and on that cheery note uh we've wrapped up ufc 268 john um you mentioned it before right at the top of the show a card which on paper could be better than ufc 267 and based on what we saw yesterday that can only be a good sign. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a good card yesterday. Uh, arguably a great card. Um, I think the main card, especially, really delivered. Um, and this main card, I think, has more potential to be exciting. Um, just nonstop action matchups. Um, Quarantillo and Burgos kicking off the main card are going to blow the roof off MSG. I mean, that's just guaranteed violence in that fight. And there's some solid prelim fights as well. Um, the two you mentioned at the beginning of the uh, the podcast and a few uh, fun prospects, Alex Pereira, Ian Gary, Melsic Bogdazarian. It's a, it's a great card. So um, hope you all enjoy the card. Thanks to Carl for having me on to, to break down the card. It's been, it's been a pleasure as always. And uh, hope you all enjoy the card. You can find me. Uh, at UFO underscore UFC on Twitter. That's UFO underscore UFC. And you can find the Martian MMA podcast, the Martian and Ozzy podcast on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify. Just search Martian MMA and you can find my podcast. So uh, thanks. Thanks for everyone. And I'll see you next uh, time for UFC 269. Yeah, thank you very much for joining me, John. Yes, if you want to get in touch with us here at INC, patreon.com forward slash it's not cage fighting it helps invest in everything that you see on your screen right now uh hopefully we will be able to invest in some lighting as well it's getting very dark over here in the uk and um, so please continue to support the channel like share subscribe ring the bell so you never miss any of our content just one more pay-per-view to go in in 2021 that's going to be ufc 269 charles Oliveira versus dust Poria will main event that one we can look forward to that in just four weeks' time. For now, though, John, I know you've got places to be, so I will leave you to it. Thank you very much once again for everyone who's tuning in. I've been Carl Bainbridge. That's been John Martian. This has been the INC, and thank you for watching.